Business for People and Planet, where we attempt to discuss the future of business and indeed the teaching of business and how they can influence society in a good way, sustainable for the planet and meaningful for its people. My name is Lucia Sweet. I'm a marketing manager at Sage and your host for the webinar series. Each episode myself or someone else will interview one of the many wonderful academics Sage works with and we invite you to join in the conversation. Um, as people are still jumping on, just a bit of admin, this will be recorded and live streamed on YouTube. Um, and the recording will be emailed sometime tomorrow to everyone who has signed up. So look out for those in your inbox. Um, and in the email, you also have lots of, lots of useful information and lots of contact details. Um, okay, I think we're ready to start. So today we have our first guest, stage author Oliver Lash, who is a senior lecturer at Manchester and adjunct associate professor at Nottingham in China. And he'll be interviewed by our very own senior commissioning editor, Matt Waters. Um, do pop your questions in the chat and I will try to uh, field them to Oliver either throughout uh, the interview or in the Q&A section at the end. And don't forget, there will also be a walkthrough of Oliver's latest title, Principles of Management, Practicing Ethics, Responsibility and Sustainability. All right then, Matt, um, I think over to you. Thanks, Lucia. Hello and good morning, afternoon or evening from wherever you join us today. We hope you're all keeping well and uh, safe at this strange and, and difficult time for the world. It's, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, I'm Matt Waters, a publisher at SAGE for business and management subjects. And our role here at SAGE in essence is to support you with business education, be it through our publishing of textbooks, online resources, digital products, educational journals, and so on. Um, and an important theme and guiding principle that is threaded throughout our business and management publishing are these topics of responsible management education and business ethics, social impact, sustainability, and so on. Um, we really believe that business education can have a positive and transformative role in the world and our aim is to support that mission. And this is why we're bringing you this new webinar series. So I'm here today with one of our key authors at SAGE, Oliver Lash. Oliver and I have worked together on a couple of books now, both an educator's research book and a teaching textbook for research for responsible management education, which um, we're just about to put up in the chat for you with the links. So uh, to kick things off, Oliver, um, we've worked together for a few years now and in all the busyness of our projects, even when we're having lunch, it's, it's usually a working lunch. I've never actually asked you this question. Um, and um, so I'll ask you now in front of a, a live audience, um, which is why are you so drawn to these topics as an author, mm -hmm. an editor, a researcher, and, a, and an educator? What is it that drives you personally? I see somebody with so much enthusiasm um, and engagement and expertise. Uh, what is it that draws you to these topics of responsible management, conscious capitalism, business ethics, sustainability, and so on? Yeah, um, well, Thank you, Matt, and uh, thank you, Lucia, as well for uh, for having me. I'm, I feel very honored to to kick off that webinar series, which I think is a a very very important one. I'm very happy that Sage um, makes that commitment to uh, uh, to furthering those topics also that through through that channel, additionally to what you're doing already. Um, yeah, it's it's an interesting question, right? Not even over lunch. Um, I, I think it probably is uh, is is uh, very much a, a love and hate theme. Um, starting out with love and uh, then going over to hate and going back to love because uh, originally I, I was very enthusiastic about management. I uh, remember actually uh, uh, packing a, um, a car for, uh, for a vacation with my parents and telling them how to, how to manage the process in the most efficient way back then being a little child and that was, they didn't like it at all. I enjoyed it very, very much. So I thought like, well, this, this organizing, managing all the practices that relate to it uh, can be very powerful. They can be very interesting. Um, and I actually had my first job um, as a um, um, kind of a head of a small insurance agency and uh, I was managing people myself uh, very early in my 20s. Um, and after a year or two, I felt this all just doesn't make sense. It's uh, in principle, that all sounds nice. We can can get so many many things done through it, but it's not done in the right way. I felt we weren't treating our customers right. I felt I always had to put pressure on on the people who were working 
um, with me for reasons that I didn't really stand behind either, that I wouldn't really buy in either. So I felt uh, that that all just doesn't make sense. And I actually stopped um, after three years. Um, and then, then I discovered a couple of years later this topic of corporate social responsibility when I, uh, when I was doing my, my studies in business education. I thought, well, this could actually work. So if we are actually getting this kind of perspective into it, so social responsibility, environmental responsibility, or environmental sustainability, uh, managerial ethics, so maybe we can actually fix the whole thing and see what, what I initially thought was so interesting about it. And um, I mean, just to, to give you one more example, something that, that always comes to my mind when, I, when I'm thinking about, about why am I doing this is, or what excites me about management is uh, Ed Freeman, who, who very often uses this example of, imagine, could we, could we have any of those awesome things around it without business management? Probably not. So he, he usually gets his, his phone out of, out of his, uh, his pocket and says, we could never have this. I couldn't speak to my children uh, in, in an instance if, if you wouldn't have business management, which builds that entire machine around it, uh, which makes that happen for us. So, and, and, and that's also what, what um, I, I'm trying to do with my, my teaching and publishing really, to find out what are the bits and pieces of management that we rather drop because they're often quite frankly nasty and they lead to outcomes which are dangerous, not only for us individual, but individuals, but as a species. Um, but how do we then, once we have dropped those, actually replace those by the things that make management something that's immensely positive? So that's really the, um, the, the, the backstory to it and, and how I ended up in the place where we are right now. Great. And the business school is the site where you do this work. So what is it about the business school or what do you think the role of the business school is in contributing to delivering societal change? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting, interesting question also because the, the business school, I, I think they're, they're yet, yet again, both of those sides to the business school and how people see business schools. Um, some people say this is where you're, as, as a young person, you're getting corrupted. Uh, when for one friend of mine who, who uh, frequently asked me, oh, are you, are you char like, if I want to have your pen, are you charging for me? Uh, uh, are you charging me for it yet? Uh, because she thought if I'm going to business school, that's the kind of person I would, uh, uh, I, I would become. Um, but also, on the other hand, I think it's, uh, it's in a certain way, and without wanting to sound overly poetic or enthusiastic about it, it's in a way, it's, it's a place where, where dreams are made and realized as well when it comes to getting new ideas out there, building an organization about, uh, around something that we think could become true, particularly if you're in the area of entrepreneurship, um, using huge organizations, uh, possibly also for, for very positive uh, social, environmental, ethical purposes. So there's a certain, um, there's a power in business school that can be used in a, in a very positive way, I think. Um, but I think to, to get there, actually, we have to, um, to not only rethink the business school, I think we have to very, very fundamentally um, reinvent business school business models. So how do business schools actually work? Um, and Muhammad Yunus, in, in an interview that we did for the book, he, uh, uh, he actually uh, pushed one extreme version of that idea to say, well, we actually need two schools. We need one school which makes all the commercial stuff happen, so which is management for, uh, for shareholders and management for growth and management for, uh, uh, for profit. But then on, on the other hand, we also need a, a business slash management school that actually uh, is more focused on the profession of management. With profession, I mean um, a type of management that actually assumes a positive role in society. So kind of a specialized function of society, if you want to, just as uh, just like doctors or lawyers or firefighters. And again, uh, you, you might think I sound slightly crazy when I'm saying this, but I think management has that, that, that function. Um, Actually, Mary Parker Follett, one, one, one of the people who has been called the, one of the gurus of management, and I think in 1928, she was writing a Harvard Business Review uh, piece about what management could become and how management could become a profession and how important that role is. Because basically managers, apart from, from fancy phones, um, well, without business management, we wouldn't have some of the most basic things we need to live in our societies. So it is a very fundamental role. It is where we get food from. Uh, it is where we, uh, how, how shelter is produced, if you want to go all the way back to the basic needs. Um, yeah, so I'm deviating there, there, there quite a bit, but I think that, so the, the business school, I think, 
um, has to has to very very strongly think about how to reinvent our ourselves. And many business schools, and, and including my own school, uh, the University of Manchester, we, we've just been came on on top out of the sustainability and impact ranking of the Financial Times. So that's that's great. But still, I think we're we're far away from doing well enough in in that respect. Um, because we're still operating basically in the same structures. We're making those structures nice social and environmental and ethical, but the very basic structures are still there. So the fundamental nature of that organization of the business school hasn't really changed. It has just been painted a little bit differently, if you want so. And, and that's something that I see in, in many of the schools that, that I'm invited to, uh, um, to do faculty development, for instance, that they're, they're really high aspirations from people. Um, and really good initiatives, but everything is within the, the very uh, kind of confined boundaries of what this organization already is. So that organizational transformation and rethinking of the underlying model, that's something that I've, I've barely seen ever. Yeah, so linked to that, I mean, having previously worked myself as an editor on other academic disciplines, what's always really struck me about the business school is, is the sheer amount of different accreditations and standards and frameworks that we follow um, and, and the value placed on those as well within business schools. So we have things like AACSB accreditation, we have um, the UN's prime initiative, um, and linked to that, we see the increasing role of the sustainable development goals, the SDGs within business schools. So my own view on these is, is quite conflicted. It's both, there's both upsides and downsides as I see it in terms of on the one hand, they, they help to elevate urgent issues and, and raise consciousness, but at the same time, they can create a certain atmosphere of, of bureaucracy and a culture of box ticking, and they can quite quickly become absorbed into the status quo. So I guess my question to you would be, how do you think we're doing in terms of championing social responsibility, purpose and impact within this culture of, of, of metrics that, that is going on within the business school? Yeah, I'm, I'm probably similarly conflicted to, uh, um, to, to what you're describing that on, on the one hand, I, I was very excited when um, quite a while ago when I, when I learned that actually um, AACSB and Equus, I remember as, as the two that probably were more, but they were on the board of the UN Prime Initiative. So very, very actively pushing this topic of responsible management um, learning, learning and education. Um, I've been critical about the SDGs, uh, although, so, so similar to what you're saying, I think they're, they're highlighting important issues. They're, they're helping us to direct efforts towards an actual goal and not just do a little bit here and a little bit there. This is all great, but I also feel the, the SDGs are a little bit too, um, um, they're too dominant, I think, because we are, we are losing a little bit of that resilience that you have if you are if you're working on on an issue in many different ways. It feels like everything has become SDGs right now, and I think in a certain way they might even have outcrowded or, or swallowed up some of the other initiatives that were doing something slightly different, uh, uh, slightly different, and uh, that that maybe have a different but positive impact to the SDGs. In terms of the business school, I'm not quite sure. I mean, I would <laughs> invite submissions, I have to say. I'm in, in my role as editor, associate editor for Academy of Management Learning Education. One of our big topics there is the business of the business school. So um, it would be really interesting to see um, out of the experience that I'm sure many people here have in their own schools, um, what's actually the role of accreditations maybe it is ACSB, which started a, um, often it's the, um, the ERS, uh, Ethics, Responsibility, Sustainability Group. I've seen many schools where those started because of the ACSB accreditation, which is great. Uh, maybe they're, they're part of the UN Prime. So that would be really interesting to, uh, to learn more about from other places. Um, so I don't have a clear, uh, I like it, I don't like it answer there, just because it does have so many, so many different sides to it. Um, the, the UN Prime actually, interestingly for me, has been very different to, uh, um, to, to that kind of uh, straitjacket that many people might describe of, of uh, different memberships, accreditations, uh, standards, and so on. For me, it's rather be a, a kind of a, a place where I can meet many people who are very like-minded and who want to do things together. So it didn't, for me, in, 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 and I've worked in, in five different schools who are Prime members now, uh, it's always been something that enabled me to do things I couldn't do otherwise, as opposed to now having to do things the way that they want. Um, so I think that's that's a very positive effect. But again, that could be different for different people, of course. So I recently attended the annual 
ICANN conference and, and what really struck me about that conference, especially with it being online with the, the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic was, was how global and interconnected uh, business faculty have become and how the challenges are now very much overlapping across borders. Um, for example, the big shift to online teaching that we saw in 2020. Uh, but at the same time, I do see an important role to play for regional groups, given that we live in a global world, but with local market conditions and cultural sensitivities at play. Um, and also, I would say that a lot of these themes of responsible management and sustainability can often have a distinctly Western or even liberal feel to them. So um, in thinking in terms of teaching and pedagogy, how do you think we can help foster a, a global movement that still allows for regional differences and identities, bearing in mind diversity among students today? Yeah, um, I mean, for some reason, the, the first edition of our textbook was called Global Sustainability, Responsibility and Ethics. So exactly that point, um, that, that kind of very important dance between global and local and how both of them um, connect. So I do think there's a case um, for um, for coordination in a certain way, so to having shared goals like the SDGs. Um, but I think it's very, very important to, to tap into um, how things are being done differently on a, on a local level. Um, culturally different in terms of religions, in terms of uh, political systems, because everybody brings something very different uh, to the table. For instance, having, having worked in China for quite a couple of years, before going there was, was uh, uh, much, much more critical than, than I came back. And because one thing that I noticed was that because of the um, uh, political system, actually things in, in terms of environmental issues could be attached so, so much more, more rapidly than, than in most of the other political systems. So I started finding something very positively uh, um, that, that I didn't expect be, uh, before. So I think we, we have to make sure that we keep um, our educational initiatives are flexible for that, that as well. Um, and I mean, particularly when it comes down to the classroom, I, I like to think more about what's happening when people actually learn and, and not only restricted to the classroom, but um, real life, of course, as well. But when I'm in that learning environment of the classroom, I'm trying to make sure that I, and that's a very silly, not, not silly, but a very, um, maybe simplistic advice, may, maybe to, to make sure that we always mix people who do have those, those different backgrounds and provide them with a context, the way how we frame our, our educational uh, um, initiatives, our pedagogies, our exercises, that keeps the space open so that those very diverse perspectives can, can emerge. So a very simple thing to, to make sure that you always have diverse teams to, um, uh, and I know many students don't like it, but to random assign teams or actually actively put teams together when they're working in groups um, that, that draw from different perspectives uh, based on what we know about the students. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm, I'm often uh, drawn to that, that what people might call a micro perspective. So how can we make it happen here? Uh, not as much to the big kind of global geopolitical picture, but rather, rather the question, what can I do right here? And uh, how, how can I get the diversity to a place that, uh, that is very useful? Um, for those those topics related to, to ethics, responsibility, and sustainability. Great. Thank you for that. And um, to, to start thinking about courses on subjects such as business ethics, sustainability, CSR, and so on, these have become fairly commonplace in business schools in recent decades as standalone modules that students can take. Um, I think most of us would agree that overall they've had a, a positive impact and they were a welcome addition. Um, but again, there have been some criticisms in terms of the ways in which they tend to silo these topics, um, almost suggesting that they're an optional um, vitamin that you might take um, and, and often at the end of your degree program as well. So often we see these uh, modules come in in the, the third or, or, or later into postgraduate education years. Um, so I'd be interested to hear your experiences of teaching these discrete courses. And then related to that, I know you're very much committed to how you can bring these topics down the curriculum. And, and you've been thinking of some innovative ways in which you can even deliver a, a principles of management course with all of these kind of topics integrated from the get-go. So students are learning straight away from when they start in the first year. So could you tell us a bit about that, please? Yeah, um, I, I think it's uh, very much also about the different uh, phases that, that, that a new 
curriculum or new new aspect of the curriculum typically runs through. I think often they start out as that that kind of um, as you described it, rather isolated standalone courses, very specialized, uh, maybe even people from other faculties having to come in. I remember my first business ethics course at the University of Frankfurt in uh, in Germany was taught by somebody from the philosophy department because nobody in the business school could do it. So I think that's, that, that's how it starts out very often. Um, but then um, something that we've seen happening quite quickly after that was really that cross-curricular integration where you're saying, okay, well, we actually want to have those standalone courses because they give you specialized knowledge and many people want and need that if they want to focus on those topics in their jobs later on. Uh, and that's actually the way how I got into, into the topic as, as well. Um, but uh, then the question is really, how do we bring it into all of the other courses as well? And I, I think four or five years ago, I actually did a quick, uh, a quick presentation at the Academy of Management, which was about different uh, forms of cross-curricular integration. So you can use cases, for instance, so whatever, whatever course you're teaching, you can always have a case with a sustainability or responsibility problem or angle or, or issue in it. Um, you could also think about uh, which concepts are we actually, so extension of concepts, if you're teaching return on investment in finance, so why don't you actually use social return on investment um, as an extension of the traditional financial return on investment? Um, or you can also think about particular exercises, so you not, not even on the content level, but you could think about uh, exercises that involves uh, or that, that engages the kind of responsibility or ethics muscle of students. So why don't you talk about have students discuss a, a moral dilemma in marketing, for instance. So once again, you're not making, you're not talking about cost related or social marketing. It's not a, not something that comes as a content. It comes as something where you're developing that skill of, of working yourself through dilemmas and thinking about what, what should I do as a marketer? So bringing that ethical dimension in uh, and so on. So there's a long list list for doing that really, but um, I think the, I mean, if you if you want, so the the kind of the race for the moon, so the place that uh, that 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 uh, I think many people want to go now, and uh, uh, is is really the, the very very early in the curriculum introduction to management or introduction to business courses. So where, and the rationale behind that is, uh, I think, is a very strong one. I actually did a special issue in the Journal of Management Education in 2015 about the, the role of introduction to management courses, how those courses shape. Um, the very idea of what management is and can be in people's heads, because I mean, let's let's face this: many of, of our young undergraduates, at least, they they don't really have an idea what management is or or what it could be. They they barely have any experience doing it themselves, at least not in a professional context. Um, so I think there's an immense opportunity in those introduction to management or introduction to business courses that are typically taught in the first or second semester on on the bachelor level already. Um, so, and, and that's exactly what uh, what the second edition of our book is for. So, to to actually provide a um, something that looks very much like like your normal principles of management textbook, but that actually has gone through the exercise of throwing away the concepts that we think actually cause the problems in management and replacing them by innovative uh, uh, innovative um, frameworks, concepts, cases, ideas that uh, that I believe could change management so reinventing management i think was something that was mentioned in the invitation to this uh, this this webinar uh, and then of course there's some there's a lot in between so many of the concepts of management that we've always taught and used in those introductory courses they're just fine um, but the idea is really to go through that um, that, that very um, interesting to, to to walk that tightrope where you're saying okay so this really is something that we cannot have here so thinking about um, talking about hu human resources, uh, which sounds like a normal thing. We all do it, right? I, I do it very often, but making people just, uh, or human beings just resources for production has so many ethical issues and it instrumentalizes people in a way that we don't even notice anymore. And that's, I think, one of the main roots why, why we see many of those scandals of what happens inside organizations to, to people working there very often. Um, so you might, might say it's silly to, to do away with the word and to call it people management, for instance. But I think this is really the type of kind of small twists that, that shape your vision of management and what management is and can and should be. Um, so that's, that's really uh, something that, that I think is important when, when presenting the topic to students for the very first time. 
Great. Um, so, and just finally, other than your own textbook, which you've already mentioned and we'll come on to again shortly, I'm interested to hear what other resources you use in your teaching of these topics. Um, I'm struck by the role of technology nowadays in the classroom, especially of late um, as a result of the pandemic. Um, and I'm also struck by um, what students are doing now in terms of their assessments and, and real life kind of community projects and working with companies and charities, problem solving and so on. So could you say just a little bit about yeah. what's gone well for you in your teaching um, of these topics, what's been a success and what students have really responded to very well? Mm -hmm. I think for me, there's two, two themes that run through my teaching, which I think are very important. Um, and, and the first theme is, um, is about making it real in, in the sense that to, to, to kind, of, um, kind of tearing down all the barriers between um, management as you're, you're being taught it should be and management that you actually do. So trying to do experiential learning, bringing people into real life situations with their uh, with their learning experiences, working on actual projects, not the artificial projects. Um, so that's one of them. Those were just a couple of examples. But the other one um, is um, this, this idea of, of whole person learning. So um, most of the time we're, we're, we're focusing very much on cognition, uh, on rationality, what's going on in our head, uh, what kind of problems we are able to solve in principle uh, by thinking about them. Uh, but there's so much more to us as, as human beings, and we actually um, did a structured literature review a couple of years ago to, to develop that teaching model for uh, kind of a whole person competence. So you, uh, with who you are, how you become into relationship with your environment, how you act, how you interact with others, what you know and how you know and how you know something is good knowledge and how you think with it and solve problems. So to reconnecting all of those different pieces and getting away from that fragmentation of saying, oh, now we're going to teach you social skills and nothing else. No, now we're going to, going to give you some knowledge. We're going to do the sustainability literacy test. And you know sustainability now. And I like the test, but it's an example of how you, how you very, very much fragment who we are as human beings. And what I'm trying to do in my teaching is that I'm trying to put it back together. Um, and one, probably my, my favorite example of that is um, a, a course that I did at the University of Tübingen in Germany, uh, I think three years ago, which was um, centered on, uh, on mobile apps. So it brings in your technology aspect there, um, where people were, were asked to uh, pick one mobile app that was related to some kind of lifestyle change towards sustainability, responsibility, ethics, some, some were sustainable consumption apps. Um, others were related more to your, your personal responsibility towards yourself. So that those were about mindfulness. Um, so every student had a different learning project and everybody was meant to, to use that app for 21 days and report about their learning every day. Uh, and that was an, a really, really rewarding experience for me to see how I felt people actually changed over those just 21 days. Um, but also it was very, very interesting because it... Um, it, it almost felt like people, it was not only the whole person learning there, but it was actually the person and the app and the environment learning. So it seemed like the, the, the learning seemed to, to, uh, uh, to kind of overflow. There were spillovers where, where the environment changed. Their, their, their friends want to start doing the same thing. Uh, they started reorganizing their closet, for instance. One person said, I'm never going to buy new clothing again because uh, I know now how to make clothing circular in general. Um, so that was really interesting because learning then becomes something that's not only about that whole person learning, but about the person and everybody and everything around them learning with them. Um, so as I'm, I'm very excited about that one. And, and if anybody gets equally or similarly excited, uh, we, we actually published that pedagogy in, in Journal of Business Ethics, if you, if you want to look it up. Um, yeah, that's where, that's where the advert stops for now. Sorry. <laughs> that's great. Thank you, Oliver. Um, so... Um, just to mention, do please keep your questions coming in on the chat and uh, we're going to get to a, a Q&A shortly. But before we do that, I think we're going to be passing over to you, Oliver, to, to give a run through of, of this textbook that we've been hearing a bit about and you're going to tell us some more. So please, okay. Look, over looks to like you. That's where the advert starts again now. I'm going to make it quick. Um, so I, I will share my screen. Here we are. Um, so if you are, um, 
interested in actually getting some of the resources, which I will show you just in a moment, you can uh, actually sign up here, not only for the inspection copy, and I think the, the link should be in the chat as well, uh, but also for the uh, um, the instructor materials, which which I will, will give you a quick run through just now. Um, so here we go. Um, so that's what it looks like. Uh, we already talked about the SDGs. The, the colors of the book are actually, uh, uh, because we do have the SDGs on, uh, on, on every page, uh, trying to find out which contents of the book relate to, to which SDG and where we could possibly even solve some of those problems. Um, then uh, the idea is really to, uh, to kind of draw people into the book from the very beginning. So the learning goals, I think, uh, are very applied, very hands-on. Uh, and then we always have one type of fact. So sometimes they're scary facts, sometimes they're fun facts, uh, sometimes they're silly facts, but something that, that draws people once again with an, an interesting observation into, into the chapters. And then, um, of course, it's, uh, it's quite a mixture between uh, uh, frameworks and concepts uh, themselves, but, but a lot of application, as you, as you see on that page, for instance. Um, and one thing that, uh, that that we try to do throughout the book is uh, really to uh, to invite the world in, if you want. So to um, well, we're doing a lot of cases, and whenever there, there are cases, it's not that removed way of saying an academic is talking about a company, but rather trying to stay very very close to the narrative of the actual company and using and part of that is using imagery uh, as you see here from the companies themselves so the idea is once again to reduce that that barrier between um, the actual practice of management and uh, and how we're teaching it uh, so we have pioneer interviews of, of really uh, i would say awesome uh, academics nancy, nancy adel for instance one of the most iconic people in in leadership but also somebody who is an artist and who brings the the human uh, and kind of emotional aspect of of leadership and management uh back in and then we do have those professional profiles as well so those are actual managers so uh people that most of most of whom i i know and who kindly agreed to present themselves so that students actually get a feeling for um, what, what responsible management or management in general looks like, how, what kind of person you can become and do in your day-to-day -day, uh, uh, day -day life, professional life. Um, so we do have worksheets in there. So the idea between those work, of those worksheets is actually that you have something that you can take and you can start drawing on uh, if you're still in a pen and paper world. Uh, and can analyze your own uh, your own managerial problems. Um, I actually had uh, somebody, um, I think he's okay with me, mentioning that Do Dora Mitrana from Romania, who, um, uh, who was a student of mine a long time ago, who just yesterday posted on LinkedIn that he actually had used the first edition of the book mostly because he used it as kind of a handbook on his, on his desk um, in, in order to do his job. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's really what I'm hoping to happen, that the boundaries between um, management uh, in the textbook and management in practice blur more and more. And for some reason, the, the second title of that second edition of the textbook is Practicing uh, Sustainability, Responsibility and act, uh, Ethics. Um, good. And then, so this, this was the, the main chapters. And then we do have a case study zone at the end with uh, full-blown uh, teaching cases, several pages long. Um, and there we were trying to have each case being centered on some kind of very uh, disruptive in a positive way, disruptive new management practice. Um, so we, we have one case about Patagonia and how they um, uh, kind of broke with many of the marketing paradigms, for instance, by telling people don't buy our jacket, at least not a new one, buy a used one, although they don't earn any money from it, as one example. Uh, or fair, fair phoning management, so the company Fairphone, um, who, uh, uh, who, who try through their own business model to transform the uh, um, kind of electronic goods uh, uh, sector. Um, so that it's, it's a very, very interesting uh, set of cases and uh, would be great to, to hear what, what you think about them as well. Um, and then this idea of, uh, of whole, uh, whole person learning. So I, I mentioned this one uh, earlier here. So knowing, thinking, acting, interacting, being, becoming. So it's something that we um, use instead of the traditional end of chapter exercises or, or questions. Um, in order to make sure that, that for each chapter, um, students actually could run through that series of exercises that helps them to train all parts of their, their professional six-pack as a manager, if you want. So, 
Um, good, and then, then there's still quite a, quite a lot of uh, instructional materials uh, beyond what's in the book. So PowerPoint slides, of course, for each chapter. I know Matt wasn't very happy in terms of how, how many I have, because I think it's about 40 or 50 per chapter, while 20 would be the norm. But I think it gives uh, people more choice to work with. We do have the instructor's manual, which I will show you just in a moment. We've got, uh, we've got a couple of hundred uh, multiple choice questions, although you might imagine from my pedagogical preferences date before that multiple choice is not my favorite form of, uh, of assessing. Uh, and we actually do have uh, a wider resource pack as well, which keeps growing. For instance, I'm building a YouTube channel right now, which has um, recordings like this one, but also one uh, almost a sample lecture, which I'm doing for different schools who adopt the book. Um, on the different chapters. So very soon uh, on all of the 19 chapters, there will be actually one lecture on YouTube um, showing how, uh, how the chapter can be used in the classroom um, by, by, uh, by those recordings. So just a couple of impressions. Uh, this is the uh, instructor manual. Um, actually somebody from, uh, uh, I think from Ch Ch Chicago, right? He, uh, he wrote to me on LinkedIn two or three weeks ago saying, well, uh, I really like the instructor manual and for him, him that was the main reason for, for, for going for that book instead of another one, because he felt that uh, he was actually able to go much deeper. So for instance, this, um, so the pedagogy deep dive for e every chapter, there are several resources uh, trying to give people, uh, instructors, pedag pedagogical advice uh, beyond what's inside the, what you would in find inside the book usually. Um, multiple choice questions, not my favorite part, but there's loads of them. And there we are. I'm done for now. Who's next? <laughs> there are some questions. There are some questions. Yeah. They are. They come in through on the chat. Um, there's an excellent question here from Karen Cripps. Karen asks, please, could you talk through the core competencies for responsible management? Yeah, interesting, Karen. Um, yeah, it's particularly interesting because we're just about to submit a, a, a paper that we uh, we didn't get to submitting for the last five years, which is on exactly that that point where we integrated. Uh, so we did a structured literature review of the ethics, responsibility, and sustainability competence literatures and integrated them because in uh, responsible management has grown in a way, as you probably know. Uh, where all three of them become uh, something that, that works together. So we're not in those domain silos anymore, ethics domains, sustainability, responsibility domains. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting mix. And I think we have 16 of those. So I, I just want to give you a couple of examples. I'm not running through the entire thing, but um, so one, one of the, so, so if, you're, if, you, if you're thinking in those six parts of the six pack, for instance, uh, one of the main think core competences was uh, um, complex uh, thinking. So complexity being able to, and, and complexity in many different ways, complexity in terms of uh, the number of different actors involved, complexity in terms of uh, interdisciplinarity. So how issues come from many different, need to be uh, approached from many different angles, um, but also complexity time-wise. So if you think about sustainability, for instance, how does what I'm doing right now impact or what does it do in 10 years? Uh, so that was one of the, the, the really, really dominant uh, core competences on, on that side. Um, if you go further down on that six pack, so in the being part, um, and, and this one is about uh, how our environment interacts with uh, who we are as, as human beings. Um, one of the dominant things, and, and I think particularly for, for UK academics, that's nothing new, is uh, this, this focus on reflexivity. So the, being, the ability to look at yourself in context, to understand what is my role here, what can be my role here, how can I rethink who I am and what I'm, what I'm doing around here, depending on the context that you're, you're in. So those are just two examples. But um, if you're interested in more, you can actually look up a working paper that we have on, on responsible management competences. So, uh, happy to share the, 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 the link later on, but I think it's easy to find on, on my ResearchGate account as well, if you just look for competences. Um, yeah. and that question made me think, Oliver, whether now would be a good time to say a little bit just quickly about your reimagining of the, the new principles of management. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's an interesting thing that came out of the book um, as, as uh, a reflection of myself that I noticed that actually across the chapters there was very often um, questions of, of, of discarding some very basic fundamental idea of management and replacing it by something else. 
Um, so and then I, uh, I just recently there's a video on YouTube as well, just two minutes uh, trying to summarize all of those different moves that I think we have to make to make in order to reinvent management. So. Uh, and some of them are very trivial and, and, and everybody is talking about them already, like going from uh, like a linear type of management where you take make and waste towards the circularity. So that's one of the very prominent ones. But then there's also others which are, uh, I think, not yet as prominent, but which should be very prominent. And one of them, I think, is the, the move from a, a growth paradigm. And it's not only growth in terms of uh, higher revenues, higher profits, uh, bigger market share, bigger economies overall growth and consumption, I want to have more, I need more. So it's not only that kind of, uh, um, uh, so it's not only the managerial type of growth, but also how growth has become embedded into all of the practice of our lives, professional and private lives. So how about what would happen if we actually would replace that underlying paradigm, that principle of growth by a principle of degrowth or maybe a principle of optimum size. So trying to get to a place where I'm, big enough, my company is big enough, my, my revenues are big enough. And uh, maybe even going a little, little bit further and saying maybe optimum size actually implies I have to, I have to uh, become smaller in many different ways. Um, I think overall I, I, I had 17 or 18 of those, those shifts in, uh, in that video, um, with, which I think neatly summarize all of the different moves that the book makes as well. Great, thank you for that, Oliver. There, there were some other questions in the chat um, around um, whether the book has online materials. Yes, it absolutely does, and and um, you've you've been through those. Also, there's a technical question as well about whether universities can can license these materials. Well, we can we can certainly uh, speak more about that about how you can have access to to these materials and and what can be provided. Um, we can follow up with more information in that regard. Um, Lucia, you know, may, you... may tap in into the first part of what you just said. Sorry for interrupting you there. Just want to want to make sure I, I mentioned that before we move on to the next bit. Um, actually, one thing that I would would really hope to happen after the session is to see many of you folks joining our uh, principles of responsible management uh, instructors group on on LinkedIn. Uh, it's about 400 500 people right now from from all over the world and in very interesting uh, uh, places as well. Um, so please feel free to, uh, um, to, to request to join that group. I'm, I'm going to get you in there right away. Send me a message if, if you want to uh, uh, contact me on, on, on LinkedIn. Um, and, uh, and hopefully we can actually keep that conversation going through uh, beyond what's here as well. So for me, one of the main instructor resources to connect back to what Matt said, their online resources, um, is actually that LinkedIn group. Because uh, not only myself, but many of the members keep posting more resources all the time, related and unrelated to the book. Uh, so I think it's it's becoming a really great resource for for everybody who's involved in, in teaching. Sorry, Matt, for uh, for that interruption, but I thought that was was important because I see a lot of potential in, in that network that's growing there. Yeah, and do you do you have the link, Oliver? Or, or yeah, I'll look, look it up. Look it up right now if uh, if you want to. If you uh, if you keep everybody entertained with a with a question, meanwhile, yes, <laughs> I can be quick with that. Well, I, I guess we should just mention that there will be more information following around um, how you can order yourself an, an inspection copy of, of the textbook and access the online resources that come with it. Um, I would encourage you also to check out the research handbook, which is also in the link. It's a fantastic collection, edited collection from Oliver and his colleagues um, around kind of all these key topics and debates that we've been discussing today. Thank you, Oliver, for the, for the link. Um, conscious of time, so we're, we're, we'll be finishing up just in a few minutes. So, Lucia, did you have any kind of closing remarks? Just really wanted to thank Oliver for agreeing to be our first guest and for such a captivating discussion on how the teaching and management can be done in a responsible way. Um, I liked how you talked about how important management can be and it can become a profession if we reinvent it the right way. Um, also, thank you, Matt, for facilitating the interview. Thank you, everyone, for signing up and also by asking questions. We will uh, make sure to answer them um, after this. As I said at the beginning, check your inbox for an email from us with the recording and information on how to order a copy of Principles of Management. And in that email, there will be contact details for, um, for me and for um, um, everyone else. And just a last plug-in for our series, Teaching Business for People and Planets. We aim to have a webinar episode per quarter. 
various themes and various guests. So continue to sign up for these um, as they come through on social media or in your inbox. And we'll see you there. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for um, joining and have a nice day. Thank you. And thank you to you, Oliver. Thanks, everybody, and for Lucia. Joining. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.